anti-God forces of the French Revolution were determined to wipe out the Catholic Church. Under penalty of death, clergy and religious were forced to swear an oath, making them servants of the secular state. They rose up with their own army to overthrow the Blues, the forces of the revolution. During the reign of terror, the village of Saint Laurent sur Sèvre was seen as a bastion of Vendée resistance with its mother houses of the missionaries of the Company of Mary and the Daughters of Wisdom. The Blues attacked, slaughtering priests, sisters, brothers, and hundreds of townspeople. Why was the faith of the Vendéens so strong? Why were they so faithful to the Holy Father? Why did they rise up under the banner of the Sacred Heart of Jesus? Because a century before, Louis Marie de Montfort, the fiery vagabond preacher, had opened the people of Vendée to the tender heart of the God who is loved. He did this by preaching baptismal renewal and total consecration to Jesus living in Mary. Saint-Laurent-sur-Sèvre in Vendée, France, Saint Louis Marie de Montfort died and is buried in this basilica. Louis Marie was a seed that flowered into three religious communities in the church. The missionaries of the Company of Mary, the Daughters of Wisdom, and the Brothers of Saint Gabriel. At the bottom of this hill is the cemetery of many of the followers of Louis de Montfort. They are seeds buried in the earth, bringing forth within the church a continuation of the life and spirituality of St. Louis de Montfort. It's not that that seed, Louis de Montfort, died only at the moment of his death here at Saint Laurent. His whole life was a dying to self and a more intense living into the life of Jesus' wisdom. Our story begins in France, in the province of Brittany, in the village of Montfort-Lacan. 
Manfred, the strong mountain, as its name tells us, is the medieval fortified town of Louis Grignon's birth. At the juncture of the rivers Mur and Gadern, it is located on the edge of the sacred forest of the Celts, the legendary home of King Arthur, Merlin, the Knights of the Round Table, the quest for the Holy Grail. As a Breton, Montfort manifests the typical Celtic temperament. You see, the Celts have a mystical rapport with the land and with the sea and with the hills and with the lochs. And they celebrate that relationship with nature in poetry, in music, in dance, in song and art. At the center of the village, on the site of its ancient castle, whose ruins can still be seen, is Louis Marie Grignon of Monfort Square. Here stands the parish church, now dedicated to its most famous citizen. In the church's open bell tower, the statue of the Father from Monfort still proclaims the glory of Christ, wisdom crucified. When Jean-Baptiste Grignon married Jean Robert, they moved into this house in the village of Montfort. It was in this room that a son was born to them on January the 31st, 1673. His name, Louis, the second of 18 children. Yet this saint who adopted the name of the village of Montfort lived here for only a few weeks. Why then did he choose to be called the father from Montfort? Because it was here in this town that he was baptized into Christ Jesus. He saw his baptism as that moment of pure grace. When Jesus Christ reached out and made him his own. At no time in his life did he ever experience himself except as one who was baptized into Christ Jesus. And therefore, he spent his life trying to discover what this salvific event of his baptism meant. His life as a free-thinking person was to either say yes or no. This is the site of the parish church where Louis Grignon was baptized. It's now a small shrine of St. Joseph. And behind me, the sacristy. It was here in this building where the baptism of Louis Grignon was inscribed into the parish registers. Among those who witnessed Louis Marie's baptism was an uncle on his father's side, Felix Grignon. Like most of the family, he was impetuous and possessed a temperament that tended to be excessively violent. He himself was imprisoned for stealing, and his son, Louis's first cousin, was convicted of murder. Louis was a true Grignon. He stated that if he had not given his life completely to the Lord as a priest and missionary, he would have become the worst criminal that France had ever known. Montfort really reveals an incredible uh, knowledge of himself and who he was and revealed an absolute need on his part for total dependence upon God and God's grace because left to his, himself he'd be lost but with God's grace if he said yes completely anything was possible as was the custom among the bourgeoisie, shortly after his birth, he was given over to a wet nurse, Mother Andre, as she was called. For the next few years, he lived with her family and many relatives at a nearby farm, La Bachelorette, owned by Louis's father.
By the time the child was weaned and returned to its parents, the family had already moved out of Monfort to a manor house close by the village of Ifondic. In 1675, the Gringen family moved from Monfort to this manor house. There were several farms connected with it, and the entire area was called Bois Marquet. Louis Gringen spent his childhood here, and he lived in a very strong Catholic family atmosphere. Even though people speak of his father as being short-tempered, nonetheless, John Baptist Gringen was a loving, Christian father. He continued his work as a notary, but the income of the family was increased by the farmlands connected with the manor house. His mother, Jeanne, of the Robert family of Rennes, was known for her quiet, saintly character. Three of her brothers were priests. Of her own children, three would become priests and two nuns. In 1684, the young Louis Grignan came here to the city of Rennes to study for eight years at this college of St. Thomas of Becket, which was run by the Jesuits. He also made some very strong friendships here, for example, with John Baptist Blaine and also with the first founder of the Holy Spirit Fathers, Claude Poula de Place. All that remains today of the Jesuit college of St. Thomas of Becket are these cloisters and the chapel, which is now the Church of All Saints. The young Lewis was considered by his professors as pious, talented, studious, and also somewhat shy, except when it came to helping others. He found ways and means of assisting the sick of the area and service to the outcasts for which he would become so well known. St. Louis's love for the Jesuits and for the Ignatian exercises lasted throughout his life, and the sons of St. Ignatius were always among his closest friends and supporters. Several shrines in this city became very familiar to Louis Marie, especially Our Lady of Miracles and Virtues at the Church of St. Savior, where he would often stop on his way home from college. It is at the Carmelite Shrine, it is said, that he became convinced of his vocation to the priesthood. Thanks to a certain Madame de Montigny, provisions were made for the 18-year-old to study at the already renowned St. Sulpice Seminary in Paris. In 1692, outfitted by his family with a new suit money in his pocket, baggage in hand, he set out for the capital. He left everything because he was burning with the desire for God, desire for wisdom, if you want to put it in his terms, Christ's wisdom. So he put everything and began to walk and began to share that God experience. Once out of sight of his family and friends, he would imitate Christ and divest himself of all that he possessed. He slept wherever he could, sometimes slept outside, under the bridges, he said sometimes. 
complete abandonment to divine providence. La providence, that was his, that was his big thing, la providence, la providence. And Manfred walked where no one was willing to walk. He was a man that really mirrored the purity of obedience, a willingness to die to self and one's own will for the sake of the kingdom. He was very much committed through his spirituality to liberating people so that they could fully live the gospel of Jesus. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, as I understand it, challenges those of us in ministry to be servants of the servants, which means we've got to be willing to walk and lay down for people where no one else walks, where no one else is willing to lay down and be that bridge. The crossing of this bridge of Sisson marks a decisive turning point in the life of Louis Grignon de Montfort. Here at the Sisson Bridge, we have Louis Grignon totally determined to live the gospel to the hilt, actively and responsibly trusting in the providence of God. As the 20-year-old Louis Grignon walked to the elegant city of Paris, he made a lifelong vow of radical poverty. He found freedom in being liberated from material goods and living for God alone. He felt it was important that he no longer be dependent upon his family for support. Um, so that when he went to Paris, he literally was on his own. And um, the resources of his family were no longer supporting him. St. Louis de Montfort in Paris. The first thing that comes to mind is this Place Saint-Sulpice, St. Sulpice Square. It's actually in this general area in St. Sulpice where Montfort spent many productive years of his life. The recent graduate from the Jesuit College at Rennes was admitted into the community of poor seminarians directed by Father Claude de la Barmondière. Two years later, this holy priest died. The residence for poor seminarians was dissolved. On September the 20th, 1694, Louis Marie wrote the following in a letter to his uncle, Father Alan Robert. Father de la Barmondière, my superior and director, who has done so much for me here. He was buried last Sunday, mourned by the whole parish and by everyone who knew him. He lived a saintly life and died a holy death. It was he who founded the seminary here and had the kindness to receive me for nothing. I do not know yet how things will go, whether I shall stay or leave, as his will has not yet been made known. Whatever happens, I shall not be worried. I have a Father in heaven who will never fail me. With no resources, the young man from Monfort moved into a hostel for absolutely destitute students. The little seminary of St. Sulpice. It is here that he completed his theological training for the priesthood. The talents of this zealous student were considered extraordinary by his professors, and it was a convert from Calvinism, Father Bayern, who encouraged Louis Marie according to the deeper mystical ways of the founder of the Sulpicians, Father Ollier. This was the French school of spirituality with its stress on the incarnation of the eternal word in the womb of Mary. Saturdays were regularly spent on pilgrimage to Mary's Cathedral, 
Notre Dame of Paris. Each year, the Seminary of St. Sulpice chose two of its students to make a pilgrimage to Notre Dame de Souterre, the Shrine of Our Lady at the Cathedral of Chartres. Shortly before his ordination, Monfort was chosen with a fellow seminarian to make this pilgrimage. One can only imagine Monfort's joy upon first sight of the twin spires of Our Lady's majestic cathedral. He must have been awestruck by the grandeur of this monument of faith which contains the legendary veil of Christ's mother. Montfort being a mystic, there's no doubt about that, no? And it was done now with the attitude of Mary. And uh, when Montfort speaks about the faith of Mary, he said that uh, she will uh, give us uh, this faith, a living faith, a faith which is uh, strong, and which is uh, like uh, a key you know, into the mysteries of Christ, into the heart of God himself. For hours he remained in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. And at the ancient shrine of Our Lady of the Crypt, he prostrated himself in prayer. The Marian dimension of his spirituality, summarized as Jesus living in Mary, was being brought to greater clarity by the power of the Holy Spirit. After approximately eight years of training at Paris, Louis Grignon was ordained to the priesthood June the 5th, 1700. The ceremony took place at the Archbishop's residence close by Notre Dame Cathedral. His first Mass was celebrated in the Lady Chapel of the Parish Church of St. Sulpice. question was, where would this zealous, newly ordained priest be assigned? His primary yearning was to become a poor, vagabond missionary. The Sulpicians found a place for him. He would work with a holy preacher, Father Levesque, who was in charge of a community of diocesan priests at Nantes. But this first assignment turned out to be a discouraging fiasco. Disappointed that his time in the community of St. Clement had failed to be the preparation for mission work that he had hoped for, Montfort said the following in a December 1700 letter to his spiritual director, Father Le Chassier. I find myself, as time goes on, torn by two apparently contradictory feelings. On the one hand, I feel a secret attraction for a hidden life. On the other hand, I feel a tremendous urge to make our Lord and His Holy Mother loved, to go in a humble and simple way to teach catechism to the poor in country places. I cannot help pleading continually for a small and poor band of priests to do this work under the banner and protection of the Blessed Virgin. Montfort's first stay in Nantes was interrupted in April 1701 by a visit to this abbey of Fontevraud to celebrate his sister Sylvia's entrance into religious life.
He had been invited by the former mistress of Louis XIV, Madame de Montespan, the sister of the abbess. After many years at the royal court, she was dismissed by the king and reformed her life. She advised him to go to Poitiers and offer his services to the former chaplain of her children, who was now the bishop of that diocese. He left for Poitiers immediately and, as always, on foot. Louis de Montfort arrived at Poitiers in the last week of October. At the time of Louis de Montfort, this building was the general hospital of the city of Poitiers. In 17th century France, general hospital meant a crowded poorhouse with many sick people and a sprinkling of robbers and thieves. In 1701, on the advice of Madame de Montespan, Father de Montfort came here to the city of Poitiers, seeking a new field of apostolate. While he was waiting for an appointment with the local bishop, he came here to this hospital, went to the chapel, and spent several hours in prayer. The poor were so taken up with him that they asked him to be their chaplain. In a May 4, 1701 letter to Father Le Chassier, Monfort reveals the circumstances of his arrival at the general hospital in Poitiers. I went into their little church to pray, and the four hours I spent there waiting for the evening meal time seemed all too short. However, it seemed so long to some of the poor who saw me kneeling there dressed in clothes very much like their own, that they went off to tell the others, and they all agreed to take up a collection for me. Not even the heavy work at the poorhouse could satisfy the bottomless desires of Father de Montfort to proclaim the gospel to the poor. To his confessional in the church of saint Porcher came throngs of people from throughout the region to gain the advice and blessing of this young spiritual master. One such person was a young 16-year-old girl, Marie-Louise Trichet, who became his first follower, the co-foundress of a non-cloistered, active, religious community of women for the service of the poor in schools and hospitals. The words that Marie-Louise heard in the dark of the confessional were words that lived in her heart and drew her inevitably to this preacher. She heard him say, it was not your sister Elizabeth who sent you, but the Blessed Virgin. St. Louis de Montfort asked her to live with a prayer group he had founded at the hospital, a prayer group made up of several poor, sickly, disabled women. The room where they met Monfort called Wisdom. He hung on the wall a large cross on which was inscribed the call of Christ to a life of poverty and obedience. And when Monfort placed that cross on the wall in the room he called Wisdom, it was as though he was offering a testament to God's unconditional love. On February the 2nd, 1703, he gave Marie-Louise a gray religious habit, the clothing of the poor servants of the area. She was the first daughter of wisdom, the servant of Jesus crucified, the eternal and incarnate wisdom. And that cross then becomes for us an invitation to go and do likewise to love as wisdom loves those whom others consider 
unlovable. However, as Monfort's zeal brought radical changes to benefit the poor at the hospital, it brought down on his head the wrath of those who formed the governing board of the institution. On the advice of his Jesuit director, he decided to leave Poitiers. in Paris, his former professor and spiritual director, Father Le Chassier, openly mocked him when he visited his alma mater, the seminary of St. Sulpice. Even his friend Blaine hesitated to show him any support, for he had heard rumors of Father de Montfort's strange ways. His chum from college days, Poula de Place, now the founder of of Holy Spirit Seminary in Paris only tentatively promised him some help in the future. Monfort went to the poorhouse of La Salpetriere. St. Louis Marie describes his work at La Salpetriere in Paris in a letter to Marie-Louise Trichet. I am at the General Hospital, where there are 5,000 people. I have to make them live for God, and I have to die to myself. Those friends I once had in Paris have deserted me. I am as happy to die to myself here as I am happy to die in the minds of some people in Poitiers as long as I find God alone there. I repeat, God alone. However, his zeal brought such jealousy from the directors that he was told to leave. He was undergoing his own crucifixion. And that was redemption for him. And in fact, it was during this period that he got, or he came into in touch with the real or the true wisdom. On a street called Peau de Fer, Iron Pot Street, the young priest found refuge in a cold, tiny room under the staircase of a dilapidated tenement in Paris. Totally alone, considered by many a failure and only three years ordained. From there, he wrote these words to Marie-Louise. Both men and demons in this great city of Paris are waging against me a war that I find sweet and welcome. Let them slander me, scoff at me, destroy my good name, put me in prison. These are precious gifts, great and wonderful things. They form the accoutrements and retinue of divine wisdom, which he brings into the lives of those in whom he dwells. When shall I possess this lovable and mysterious wisdom? When will wisdom come to live in me? When shall I be sufficiently equipped to serve as a place of rest for wisdom in a world where he is rejected 
and without a home. Yet it was from within this incredible darkness and abandonment that Father de Montfort wrote a brilliant spiritual masterpiece, the foundation of all his spirituality, the love of the eternal wisdom. A man is worldly wise who, following solely the lead of his senses and human reasoning, poses as a good Christian and a man of integrity, but makes little effort to please God or atone by penance for the sins he has committed against him. The worldly man bases his conduct on personal honor, on what people will say, on high living or self-interest. Substantial or uncreated wisdom is the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. So Montfort speaks you now about this relationship of uh, the Trinity. It is God the Father who wanted to uh, ask Mary through the angel. It is God the Son who want to uh, be born, conceived into the womb of Mary. And all is, that is done through the power of the Spirit. Wisdom is the cross, and the cross is wisdom. The Moffat ties in wisdom and the cross, and you cannot separate wisdom from the cross and the cross from wisdom. There's no saint that never had any crosses. Here below, you'll never understand the cross, but it's there, and it's going to be there, and you have to learn how to accept that cross each day. And that's the secret of sanctity. That's the secret of the wisdom. To know Jesus Christ, the eternal and incarnate wisdom, is to know enough. To know everything else, but not to know Jesus, is to know nothing. For all that he wrote about the beautiful doctrine of, of, of divine wisdom, Montfort wanted above all to get down to the grassroots of fundamental faith, to get the people believing in Jesus and having a relationship with Christ nourished through the sacraments, through the help of the Holy Spirit. He was given out of love and fashioned by love. He is therefore all love or rather, the very love of the Father and the Spirit. And that's what he wrote down in uh, the love of eternal wisdom, which means first the love that God has for us, not the one we have for him. That's the, the second meaning. But the first must be there. He, he loves us before we even uh, exist and uh, he wants us to love him back. Mary is the surest, the easiest, the shortest, and the holiest of all means of possessing Jesus Christ, wisdom. And Blessed Dantine gives me a hand, and so we go together to Jesus Christ, and to the Holy Trinity. The lack of apparent success he had in his own country made him wonder if God was not calling him to the foreign missions. He decided, as usual, on a bold and striking solution which epitomizes his personality. He, an unknown young priest, go on pilgrimage to Rome on foot and seek the advice of the Vicar of Christ, the Holy Father. It was the spring of 1706 when he traveled to Rome from northwestern France. 
He goes to Rome, <laughs> headquarters, and he walks. He doesn't take a stagecoach, he walks. Typical, Montfort. He was really a vagabond. I heard him a vagabond saint, you know. On this trip when he went to Rome, I can imagine why he slept on the, on the road, on the roads there, going down there, you know, wherever he could. If they take him in, they'd take him in. If he wouldn't, he'd have to find a place for himself. We do not know his exact route to Rome. We are certain that he visited the shrine of the Holy House at Loretto. Tradition claims it to be the home of the Holy Family, miraculously transported from Nazareth. When the dome of St. Peter's loomed on the horizon, the pilgrim took off his sandals and walked barefoot to the tomb of Peter. It is quite certain that he enjoyed the hospitality of the Theatine Fathers, where he met Blessed Tomasi, a close confidant of the Holy Father, Clement XI. Arranged by Tomasi, Father Louis Marie's audience with the Pope took place on June the 6th, 1706. It is said that when he saw the successor of Peter, he believed he was seeing Jesus Christ in the person of his vicar. In Latin, Monfort poured out his heart to the universal pastor. It must be great to just walk, and walk into the Pope and say, hey, can I have an audience? And, and the, the Pope says, well, what's wrong? And he says, well, he says, I'm fed up. I, say, I want to be a missionary in North America. Pope Clement quickly sized up the situation. Not only did he approve of Monfort's apostolate, but knowing that the church in France was beset with difficulties, he said to Father de Monfort, you have, Father, a large enough field in France to exercise your zeal. Do not go elsewhere. Work always in accord with the bishops in whose dioceses you will be called. In this way, God will grant his blessings to your work. The Holy Father then conferred on him the title, Missionary Apostolic. The fiery young priest had his answer. Part of the mind forcing calling, you might say, is the idea of, of this kind of unity under authority that obedience to the bishop, obedience to the pope, it's, it's, it's an important element. It's an element important because of the necessity of maintaining the authenticity of the faith. So Montfort says, right, the pope has spoken, but he's got a passport. The pope says, you're an apostolic missionary. Green light, great. So he goes back and he waves this in front of the bishops. And he doesn't have an easy time, but it's not as strenuous as before. At this abbey of St. Martin at Ligouget, on the outskirts of Poitiers, a young brother Matherin waited for him on his return from Rome. For the rest of his life, he would be Monfort's faithful companion in his missions and undertakings. When Matherin saw his friend approaching the monastery, he said that Monfort was hardly recognizable. His face was burnt by the sun. His look was of total exhaustion. The priest and the brother began a new journey together, joyful troubadours of the tenderness of Jesus and Mary. Monfort and his companion headed north to the famous shrine of St. Michael the Archangel, Mont Saint-Michel. Arriving on September the 29th, the Archangel's feast day, they spent the next 15 days in retreat on this monastery island 
which divides Brittany from Normandy. They begged for the strength to sustain the great missionary campaign they were about to undertake as the Holy Father had commanded. Entering Brittany, they made a brief stop in Rennes, where the saint paid a visit to his parents. Passing through his hometown of Montfort, he continued on to Dinan. Behind me stands the beautiful walled city of Dinan in Brittany. In 1706, shortly after his return from his pilgrimage to Rome, St. Louis de Montfort entered this city in order to take part in the preaching of a great mission to all of the people of this town. Dinan reminds us of Montfort's incredible love for the poor and also for his determination to have his beloved lay people take part in the apostolate. One evening, as he was returning to his lodgings, he saw a homeless leper. The saint lovingly lifted up the poor man and carried him to the door where the preaching team lodged. It was locked. He banged on the door, crying out several times, open up to Jesus Christ. Not open up to someone who represents Christ, but open up to Jesus. Because in Montfort's thought, he was carrying Jesus. That night, the leper slept in the missionary's bed, and in the arms of Montfort, he died. I will love my God who lives in my neighbor. My God who lives in my neighbor. Now these were Montfort's words then. They're the same today. I think that for me, Montfort is a radical missionary. And I think he challenges the world today to open the doors for Jesus Christ. Montfort's attraction to the poor is rooted in the fact that he saw Christ and his mother Mary as being one of the poor, the Anna Wynne. Montfort's option and preference for the poor was related closely to the fact that Mary was a spokesperson for the poor, or the people of Israel. Montfort's experience here in Dinan demonstrates his determination that lay people must live their baptism and must be involved in the apostolate. He met a Count and Countess de la Garre. The Count and Countess, after a dramatic conversion, dedicated their wealth and property to the service of the sick poor. They were strongly encouraged by Montfort not only to continue their work but to recruit other lay people in their mission. The clinic they established in this building on their estate has grown into what today is the main hospital of Dino. One of the great gifts that Manfred offers the church of the 21st century is a simple pilgrim Christian who is so passionately committed to the gospel that the gospel of Jesus was preached to the richest of the rich and the poorest of the poor. And in his eyes, they were the same. From the beginning of 1707, St. Louis de Montfort's life is a narration of one parish mission after another. His dynamic and solid preaching his pageantry, songs, dramatic plays, and gospel musicals attracted entire towns and cities. 
not fitting in with another priest's mission team, he organized his own. Monfort and Mathurin were carefree vagabond troubadours, singing of the infinite love of Jesus and Mary. In one of the hundreds of canticles which St. Louis de Monfort composed, he sang of his way of life. Que mon âme chante et publie à la gloire de mon sauveur Les grandes bontés de Marie envers son pauvre serviteur Pour aller à Jésus, allons chrétiens, allons par Marie. Pour aller à Jésus, c'est le divin secret des élus. You realize how much in touch he was with his own culture. And he, he was so creative that he used the music of the time, the current popular music, and set his hymns to that music. St. Louis de Montfort spent from September 1707 to May 1708 at the peaceful hermitage of St. Lazarus, near his birthplace, the village of Montfort, leading a prayerful apostolic community life with Matherin and a few other brothers. Montfort clearly possessed artistic gifts. While at St. Lazarus, he carved this crucifix and restored this chapel. These are some of the objects he carved or painted and some of the churches he restored during his ministry. They reflect the tender love and gentle compassion of Jesus and Mary. He was a carver. I mean, could you do that? I mean, I, I couldn't do that. <laughs> That's brilliant, isn't it? And it's so small, this figurine. It's a replica of the real thing, and I've held it in my hands and, and roamed it, the real thing. That's why all mystics have gone through some kind of artistic or uh, symbolic expression. And Monfort was an artist. How can you understand what you reason, the love of mother, uh, of your mother? You feel it. You express it by symbols. It's the same with God. Around the middle of 1708, he left his home territory for the Diocese of Nantes. Louis Marie's mission campaign took him to many parishes throughout the Diocese of Nantes. Everywhere he preached in the Nantes area, there were stories of remarkable conversions, of apparently miraculous events. It was said that the saint multiplied bread, spoke with a woman who shone with dazzling brightness, cured the sick, and in the confessional, healed those burdened with guilt by a loving, firm tenderness which brought untold numbers back to the practice of the faith. Yet, attempts were also made on his life. But worse still was the opposition from both civil officials and from some authorities of the church. This becomes clear in what is called the Pontchateau Affair.
Brittany, Poitou, Vendée, the lands are all dotted with crosses planted by St. Louis de Montfort, but nothing can equal this Calvary at Pont Chateau. In 1709, Father de Montfort preached a mission here in the parish of Pont Chateau. It was then that he decided that in this area of the parish called the land of the Magdalene, he planned to build an immense Calvary. Monfort's preaching had so moved the people of the region that thousands came to help build the Calvary atop a hill which dominated the area for 25 miles in every direction. This enormous Herculean effort on the part of ordinary human beings is astronomical. And, and I'm sure that when, when it was finally erected, not only was it a beautiful object, but seen almost to be a living, breathing entity because it was the expression of the living faith and love and dedication of these people. September the 14th, 1710, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross, the bishop had agreed to come here and bless the shrine. The day before the blessing of the shrine was scheduled, the bishop sent a note saying not only that he would not be here, but that the shrine, the Calvary, could not be blessed. As thousands of people waited for the celebration of the solemn blessing, Monfort walked all night to Nantes to discuss the matter with the bishop. He arrived at the bishop's house at six in the morning. Not only did St. Louis Marie find out that the bishop was adamant that the Calvary should not be blessed, he discovered that on the orders of the king himself, it was to be torn down. Montfort's enemies had lied to Louis XIV, convincing him that the Calvary could somehow become a fortress for an invading English army. To have that torn down, seems to be such a defeat and such an absurdity. With his personality, he probably was hopping mad. The natural human response would be simply to say, it makes no sense, um, and therefore, in the future, why try? To give up and just say, I go inside myself. Nonetheless, it was impossible to continue this work. And as St. Louis de Montfort said himself, God asked me to build this Calvary, and now God is asking me to destroy it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This surrender to the mysterious ways of God's providence became a great blessing for this Calvary. Whenever we die with Christ on the cross, we rise with him to newness of life. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. Monfit, praying with Mary, had to leave room for God. So that all the good that can be accomplished by the building of Pont Chateau can actually be outdone. God's grace can be more abundant in the face of its destruction and people's continuing fidelity and faith to God's presence. And that's Montfort. You know, he wasn't afraid to say what he thought, but when push comes to shove, whether it be a superior or a bishop, uh, obedience was, that's where it's at. And that's the cross. That's the cross. And I have always seen the cross, at least in my, my years as a religious, thanks to Montfort, not as a burden or as a curse, but as an opportunity and as a blessing, as a transforming moment that really puts everything into perspective. Because without the cross, there can be no resurrection. Without the cross, there can be no new life. In the 19th century, the Calvary of Pont Chateau was rebuilt by the people of the area, who still clung to the memory of the good father from Montfort.
At the beginning of Lent, 1711, the missionary left Nantes for the dioceses of La Rochelle and Luçon. The bishops of both areas were graduates of St. Louis Marie's alma mater, the Sulpician Seminary in Paris. Both were well known for their opposition to the heresy of Jansenism. They provided a real home for Montfort's apostolate in Vendée. Louis Marie's mission campaign took him to many parishes throughout Vendée. During the five years that he spent preaching in this area, he used this place of solitude as his home base, saint Eloi in La Rochelle. After preaching a mission, he would come back here, quiet, solitude, and deeply immerse himself in the power of the Spirit so that he could go to the next parish and in the power of the Spirit bring about the reign of Christ through the reign of Mary. But in meeting Jesus Christ at that moment, those pure moments of contemplation, Montfort, like Jesus Christ, becomes more and more the one for others. It's during these periods of solitude that St. Louis Marie de Montfort composed his masterpieces. In fact, it's right here in the Hermitage of Saint Eloi at La Rochelle that St. Louis de Montfort composed the true devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. The manuscript is right behind me. His principal biographer, Father Lacrum, writes, St. Louis de Montfort undertook the writing of the True Devotion with great enthusiasm. And Lacrum quotes Montfort's words, My heart has just dictated everything that I have just written, and with a particular joy. It was through the Blessed Virgin Mary that Jesus Christ came into the world. And it is also through her that he must reign in the world. For Montfort, it is his devotion is an imitation, not of Mary as such, but of Christ, depending upon Mary. And more than that, for him, it is an imitation of the Trinity itself. She's always the first. She's a model, the perfect model. She said yes for every one of us already but she's trying to help us to say our yes. God the Father gave his only son to the world only through Mary. The Son of God became man for our salvation, but only in Mary and through Mary. God the Holy Spirit formed Jesus Christ in Mary, but only after asking her consent. Mary gives the Holy Spirit visibility. Mary is a window into the workings of the Holy Spirit. The icon is a window to heaven. It's a prayerful window to heaven. And when you look at the life of our Blessed Lady, she resonates at the workings of the Holy Spirit. God the Father gathered all the waters together and called them seas. He gathered all his graces together and called them Mary. God the Son imparted to his mother all that he gained by his life and death, namely his infinite merits and his eminent virtues. God the Holy Spirit entrusted his wondrous gifts to Mary, his faithful spouse. It is with the eyes of Mary that he was looking at Jesus. It is with the heart of Mary that he is, he is entering into communion with Christ. And it is with the hands of Mary that he goes and gives Christ to the other. The conduct which the three persons of the Most Holy Trinity have deigned to pursue 
in the incarnation and the first coming of Jesus Christ, they still pursue daily in an invisible manner throughout the whole church. And they will still pursue it even to the consummation of ages in the last coming of Jesus Christ. He conducted a city-wide mission in the port city of La Rochelle. The famous mission marked a true turning point in the life of the city. He knew it was in their heart. Therefore, when he put together a mission, he put together the means by which to let these folks know that he was walking with them, that he knew who they were. He knew where to meet them and to walk with them. The person who has taken the time to walk with me and respects me is probably the only person that can really challenge me. So this is what we see also in Manfoot. He was a man of God. He experienced God. And that experience helped him to overlook everything else that on the way, but to call people to that love, to that experience. Those attending the mission celebrated the sacrament of reconciliation. Most importantly of all, the Eucharist became ever more so the center of parish life. His sermons were like the fire of the Holy Spirit, transforming the fearful into valiant apostles. To them, he preached a way of life called holy slavery of love this active and responsible stripping away of all that is fake and alien to God endows us with the true liberty of the children of God. The father from Montfort was sometimes interrupted by the weeping of those who listened to him. And when he could no longer be heard, he was obliged to stop and said, My dear children, do not weep you are making it impossible for me to preach. And it is even more necessary to teach you and enlighten your minds than to touch your hearts. Montfort's missions, his parish missions, always had somewhat the same structure of, of not only the preaching to the adults, but also the catechism for the children, the youth groups, that there was some kind of activity, some catechetical activity for all the, the age groups in the parish so that when he left the parish and the parish mission, he left it with people who were better educated in the faith, which made them better able to communicate the faith. At a grandiose ceremony, each participant signed a copy of this covenant contract, the renewal of their baptismal promises through Mary. All this consecration is trying to imitate Jesus. It's a perfect imitation of Christ. That's why the Muffet said it's perfect, because now you're doing it not only as a grown-up, knowing what you're doing. A child, you didn't know baptism, you didn't know what you were doing, being done. Now you're going to speak in your, for yourself, and you're going to do it through Mary. The Montfortian charism is based on baptism and the commitment that comes with baptism to renounce evil, the devil, and to incorporate into the church, which is the body of Christ, the mission of being an evangelizer. The spirituality in itself can be used by all because it's, it's based on the gospel, it's based on the sacraments, and it's, it's simple enough where it doesn't require a tremendous education to understand it. Stories of extraordinary events accompanying Montfort's preaching became more and more numerous. His face appeared to shine from some inner light. Crosses were seen in the sky. People were healed. The mission concluded with a magnificent procession from here, formerly the Dominican Church, to the Church of Our Lady. It was a celebration on the grand scale, festive, joyful, creative, symbolic, with trumpet fanfares and banners flying. The 
Blessed Sacrament was carried by the missionary in these Eucharistic processions, which magnificently concluded the city mission. The biographer Baynard writes, the whole city of La Rochelle has been touched, moved, one might say, completely transformed. Louis de Montfort left behind him confraternities for the men, the women, and for the soldiers, clinics and hostels for the poor, the custom of the daily rosary, religious free schools conducted by lay men and women. St. Louis was really a missionary, and a missionary not only in the past, for the present, for the future, is a leader for the new evangelization. And yet, the more he brought people to the Lord, the more he was opposed. In La Rochelle, he miraculously evaded a group of thugs lying in wait to kill him. The Calvinists, who were numerous in the city, poisoned his soup. Monfort survived, but his health was broken. St. Louis de Montfort began a grueling schedule of missions and retreats. His mind was occupied with assuring the foundation of his congregations, the Daughters of Wisdom and the missionaries of the Company of Mary. He established charitable schools for poor youngsters such as the one here, across from the General Hospital of St. Louis. It was a seed which would eventually flower into the Brothers of St. Gabriel. Having written a rule for the Daughters of Wisdom, he wrote to Marie-Louise and Catherine Brunet, I have spoken several times to his lordship, the Bishop of La Rochelle, and he thinks you ought to come here and begin the work we want so much. But an enterprise which is going to do so much for the glory of God and our salvation will have its way strewn with thorns and crosses. If you don't take risks for God, you won't give anything worthwhile. When Montfort returned to La Rochelle on April the 14th, 1715, he sent word for Marie-Louise and Catherine Brunet to meet him at the Jesuit country house. There, he named Marie-Louise the first superior of the Daughters of Wisdom. He had also written a rule for the missionary priests of the Company of Mary, but so far, only Matherin and a few other brothers were his followers. At a retreat preached in this chapel of the Sisters of Providence in La Rochelle, a young priest, Adrian Vatel, was so struck by the missionary that he became his first priest recruit. During the summer of 1715, Louis Marie would often live in this cave in the forest of Mervan. Here he could spend his time in prayer and contemplative solitude. In the fall of 1715, the ways of Providence led him to the man who would be his successor, the first superior general of the Company of Mary. This is the parish church at Saint-Pompin. Saint-Pompin is considered to be the birthplace of the missionaries of the Company of Mary. Father de Montfort had no intention of preaching a mission here at Saint-Pompin. He was influenced to do so by the parish priest's brother, Father René Mulot. Father de Montfort laid down one condition. He looked at Father René Mulot and said to him, I will preach a mission at your brother's parish, at Saint-Pompin, provided you follow me for the rest of your life. And Father Milot was startled. 
He told Father de Montfort that was utterly impossible. He was a sick man. His health was already broken. In fact, he was living with his brother and doing no ministry. And Father de Montfort stared at Father Mulot and said, if you follow me, all your problems will disappear. Father Mulot agreed. Father Mulot went on to become the successor of St. Louis de Montfort and one of the greatest preachers in this part of France. Before leaving saint pompin the holy missionary sent 33 members of the White Penitent Confraternity to the Marian Shrine of Saumur. They were to go on pilgrimage, begging the Lord to send good recruits to his hoped-for missionaries of the Company of Mary. When the pilgrims returned, he set out on the last pilgrimage of his life. This is the shrine of Notre Dame des Ardillers of Saumur. Within this niche, on the other side of the grill, is a small representation of Our Lady of Sorrows. Notice how the entire ministry of Montfort is enclosed by pilgrimages to this shrine of Our Lady of Sorrows of Saumur. Shortly after his ordination, he comes here. In 1716, shortly before his death, he comes here. The first visit, 1700, to consecrate his ministry to the Lord in 1716, to consecrate to the Lord the ministry of all the future members of his missionaries of the Company of Mary. On April the 1st, 1716, St. Louis de Montfort entered the Vendean village of saint laurent sur sèvre for his final parish mission. It was from here that he wrote his final letter addressed to his beloved sister Marie Louise of Jesus. We want to found our congregation on the wisdom of the cross of Calvary. This adorable cross has been stained with the blood of a God and chosen by Jesus to be the spouse of his heart, his heart's only desire and inspiration the only object worth his toil, his only arm in combat, his only crown of glory, his only guide in judgments. I will never forget you. I am united with you in bearing the cross as long as you follow the holy will of God and not your own. This is the Chêne Vert, the Green Oak Inn at saint laurent sur sèvre It is here that St. Louis de Montfort lodged while he was preaching a parish mission here in April 1716. While he was preaching the mission, he caught a bad case of pleurisy. He died um, the way that he lived, which was full tilt, spending himself completely. All through his life, Montfort was very conscious that he had been baptized into Christ Jesus. In his death, Montfort makes his definitive choice for Christ Jesus and so enters into the fullness of life promised to those who are baptized. My understanding of Montfort has always been that there is no halfway to commitment, that it's all or nothing. I mean, Deus Solis, God alone. It's not maybe God, it's not part of God, it's, it's God alone. On Wednesday, April the 22nd, Bishop Champfleur of La Rochelle, a faithful friend of Montfort, was scheduled to assist at the mission exercises. Father Mulot begged the saint, who was burning with a high fever, to remain on his bed of straw and not try to preach that day. However, the ardent apostle yearned to preach one last time. 
knowing that it would be his last sermon, his final proclamation of the word, he chose as his farewell theme the gentleness, the tenderness of Jesus and Mary. Broken by the fever, he came back to this inn, went into this room, and on April the 28th, at about 8 o'clock in the evening, 1716, St. Louis de Montfort died. St. Louis de Montfort's death would be a witness to the peace and gentleness which comes from God alone. After receiving the sacrament of the sick from Father Mulot, he blessed the many people who flocked around his bed. With one last effort, he managed to sign his last will and testament. He then set off on his final pilgrimage. The vagabond troubadour entered into the glory of the tenderness of God. He disappeared from human sight, passing across the horizon of earth to heaven. Those around his bed heard his last words. In vain do you attack me now, for I am between Jesus and Mary. Thank God and his Holy Mother. It is accomplished. I shall never sin again.
interested in obtaining a video cassette of this program, call the toll-free number of the Montfort Missionaries at 888-448-MARY. Also available at the same number are the following books. God Alone, The Collected Writings of St. Louis Marie de Montfort, and the comprehensive new work which inspired this program entitled Jesus Living in Mary, the Handbook of the Spirituality of St. Louis Marie de Montfort. Available as well is the Montfort Missionary bi-monthly magazine, Queen of All Hearts. If you believe that you might have a calling to the missionaries of the Company of Mary, the community St. Louis de Montfort founded, contact Father Roy Tverdick, Vocation Director. He can be reached as well at the same toll-free number, 888-448-MARY.